any pulmonologist uh, repose on behalf of the, of the, of the applicants. And we are dealing here with something which is to a large extent a respiratory uh, disease. So, although uh, the, the court itself will, will, will not delve into the pros and cons of the expert evidence, I think it is important to note uh, the nature of the expertise that has been put before, before this court. Yes. Uh, then, in paragraph 34, say the FITA contends that the damage to smokers is already done. Their state of health will remain the same regardless of whether they stop smoking during the temporary ban. Peter makes no attempt to engage with the facts the minister has put up on this issue. Contends itself with sweeping statements that smoking during temporary period will not meaningfully or discernibly alter the state of health of the patient. And we, we submit that that is not true on the basis of, of the evidence that, that is before this court. Uh, the evidence clearly points out that ceasing of smoking, the benefits of ceasing smoking uh, are, are immediate. And it was for that reason that the World Health Organization has recommended in its statement on COVID-19 uh, and smoking that, 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 that smokers take immediate steps to quit. And we refer uh, on this issue to what we, we say in, uh, in our main heads at paragraph 80 to 85. Then the next issue uh, which I was questioned about by the court before we adjourn appears at page 35. That FITA argues that prohibiting sales is not an effective means of preventing people from smoking as illicit cigarettes are, av are readily available. Uh, we, we submit that, uh, that FITA fails to engage with the evidence and analysis by the minister to show that the, the ban, in fact, has been sufficiently uh, effective. Uh, it simply says the minister's contentions in this regard are un untenable. Uh, we, we, we submit that the the answering affidavit explains that a study conducted by the Human Science Research Council indicated that 88% of the people had not been able to purchase cigarettes during the lockdown. And we submit that FITA cannot counter this report. Uh, and the answering affidavit also explains that even if reliance is, is placed on UCT study, that is a study on which uh, the applicants rely, uh, the ban on tobacco sales has been notably effective in reducing smoking. According to that report, 16% of the respondents had successfully ceased smoking during the lockdown. We submit that that, that is actually a significant uh, gain, and that is recognized by uh, uh, the FITA's own expert. Uh, now, we come to the question of the process that, that was followed. Cons consultation, Audi, and legitimate expectation, uh, which is mentioned by the, the applicants. Uh, well, we, 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 we deal largely this issue in paragraph 91 to 98.4 of our main submissions, and we're not going to repeat that. But we still make the following submissions. The applicants uh, 
allege or complain that they were actually refused Audi. Now, we, we say in our submissions that FITA appears to be confused regarding the standard of review. It refers to cases concerning the requirement of public participation in the legislative process and the requirement of Audi in administrative decision making and then seeks to apply these in this case to executive action. We submit that they cannot do that. And we refer in particular uh, to the constitutional case, Law Society, where the court held as follows, public participation in the lawmaking process is a requirement specifically provided for in our constitution. That must be met by our <coughs> lawmaking institutions. But particip participatory democracy is not provided for in similar terms in relation to the exercise of presidential or executive power. <coughs> There's no legal provision or principle that even remotes, <coughs> remotely imposes an obligation on the executive to invite the public to participate in its decision-making processes as proposed. <coughs> I'll not quote the rest of the decision. Uh, and that the only case to which FITA refers that has any application to executive action is, is the Albert case, uh, of, of which one has a, a passing knowledge of. However, all the court held in that case was that consultation would be necessary where this was required to render the process rational. That's not the same as a self-standing requirement of procedural fairness. And we, we submit that the Constitutional Court has uh, confirmed that in, in the Law Society case. We, 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 we submit that on the authorities that the minister has actually no obligation uh, to consult in that sense. And it's, it's not required under the Act when we deal with that in our main case. Further, even, even if there was such a requirement, we submit that the minister has in fact consulted with the public and the applicants themselves made submissions in support of, this, of their position, which were considered in the, dis, in the decision-making process. So we, we submit that the applicants cannot claim uh, that their procedural rights were undermined. FITA also tries to invoke the doctrine of legitimate expectation. We, we submit that the doctrine of legitimate ex <coughs> expectation applies only in respect of administrative action. And uh, FITA has not referred to any authority uh, making the ground of that ground of review applicable uh, to executive action. In any event, as we explained, FITA's voice was actually heard. It saw the need to make submissions and did so. In reality, its complaint is not that it was not given the opportunity to make submissions, but instead that those submissions did not win at the end of the day. And we submit that that is really not a, a ground for review. FITA also says that uh, Minister failed to give proper consideration to various factors. We, we submit that that is not true. We submit that all the relevant factors were considered, and we've dealt with that in our main heads, paragraphs 99 to 109. But if, if one looks at, at Fitter's complaint, really what, what they are actually saying 
is that their submissions were not given sufficient weight. That is the nub of uh, uh, their complaint. But we, 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 we submit that the weight to be given to a particular consideration is preeminently a matter of discretion, which the minister must be given leeway to determine. In that connection, uh, we, we refer uh, to the case of MEC, Environmental Affairs and Development Planning versus Clarison CC. We refer this to this in our bundle at uh, 021334. In particular, uh, paragraph 22, what, what, where the following is said. Uh, what was said in Durban Rent Board is consistent with present constitutional practice, and we find no need to reformulate what was said pertinently on the issue that arises in this case. The law remains as we see it, that when a functionary is entrusted with a discretion, the weight to be attached to particular factors, or how far a particular factor affects the eventual determination of the issue, is a matter for the functionary to decide. And as he acts in good faith, and reasonably and rationally, a court of law cannot interfere. That seems to us to be one manifestation of the broader principles explained in a context that does not arise in this case in Belporto and, and Batusta. Yes. <coughs> Uh, Fita also once again misconstrues the ap applicable legal test. It refers to Bantu Brothers, a 1973 decision of the then Natal Provincial Division, authority for the proposition that the minister was required to consider relevant factors. We submit that the currently applicable test is the one uh, in the democracy Democratic Alliance case, uh, we, we set out the reference in paragraph 100 of our uh, main heads. Well, on, on that test, we submit that there's no basis for FITA to claim that the process uh, involved or adopted was irrational. Now we deal with the allegation that there was X post facto justification uh, and we refer to this as, as a startling proposition. Fitter submits that the record and the reasons are replete with material obtained after the date of the decision. Well, it doesn't point out what the material is. What FISTA seems to be referring to is the fact that the answering affidavit, not the reasons and the record, the answering affidavit contains material obtained after Regulation 27 was promulgated. But once again, we, we, we deal with that in our main heads at 141 to 142. Uh, and, and the reference to additional material we submit was necessitated by FITA's own action <coughs> in bringing a new review in its supplementary founding papers to Regulation 45. It will be recalled that the original application uh, sought to impugn Regulation 27. But the new case uh, was to impugn Regulation 45. We submit that 
it was therefore necessary in defense of this new case and regulation 45 to attach material to the answering affidavit that was considered after regulation 27 had been promulgated in deciding whether to continue the prohibition into level 3. Therefore, the inclusion of additional material in answering affidavit ought not to have been surprising to FITA, nor does it amount to an ex post facto attempt to justify the prohibition. In fact, it, it attests to the fact that additional material was considered after Regulation 24 was promulgated in deciding whether to continue the ban into Level 3. We submit, therefore, that it is contrary to what FITA is saying, evidence of good decision-making. We then deal with uh, another submission to which Melania Friend made criminalizing conduct. Uh, the applicant refers to provisions of the regulations that create offenses and make submissions to the effect that criminalizing the sale of tobacco products is unlawful. Uh, we submit that that is a new case but a misguided case. The regulations prohibiting the sale of tobacco products are distinct from the regulations that make the contravention of the prohib prohibition regulations an offense. Curiously enough, FITA does not challenge the offense creating regulations under the Act. Its challenge is only to Regulation 27 and 45. And we submit that neither Regulation 27 nor 45 creates any offenses. And neither regulation also crim criminalizes conduct. Therefore, we submit that the legality of an offense creating regulations is not before this honorable court. FITA's case is not whether the minister acting under Parliament's delegated authority in terms of the Act has the power to create new offences under the Act. Uh, yes. In, a, in any event, the creation of an offence uh, for contravening regulation passed in terms of the Act is founded in the Act itself. Section 27, sub 4 of the Act provides that the regulations made under 27.2 may include regulations prescribing penalties for any contravention of the regulations. And Section 59.3 says that the Minister may prescribe a penalty of imprisonment for a period not exceeding six months or a fine for any contravention of or failure to comply with a regulation. Now, Leonard Friend has made very much about what the President did or said on the 23rd of April and wishes the court to draw certain inferences from that. We deal with that, Lord, my ladies, from paragraph 53 uh, of our supplementary heads, where FITA makes, <coughs> seems to make much of the supposed U-turn from the position expressed by the President in, in his address on the said date. And they allege that as, as Melanie Trent has, has submitted, that the Minister's decision to promulgate Regulation 27 must clearly have been contrary to what the Expert Advisory Committee to the First Respondent and Cabinet had advised. We submit that that assertion has no basis in the facts. The answering affidavit is clear that the President made this statement based on the view that the National Coronavirus Command Council 
had taken on the issue at the time. It is also clear that it is not the case that the president and the minister were somewhat at odds over the issue. After the president's initial announcement was made, further consideration was given to the issue in the light of submissions received and medical evidence. And a different position was ultimately adopted. And, and, and this state of affairs is confirmed by Dr. Lubisi in, in his supporting affidavit, where he says, a statement made by the president in his address on the 23rd April that during level four, the sale of cigarettes would be permitted accorded with the view that the NCCC had taken on the issue at the time, that view was subject to further consultations. The decision to promulgate the prohibition on the sale of tobacco, tobacco products in Regulations 27 and 45 was endorsed by the NCCC before those regulations were promulgated. And we submit that Dr. Lubisi is eminently positioned to give this evidence. He has personal knowledge of these matters because he attends NCC meetings in both his capacity as Director General in the Presidency and as Secretary of the Cabinet. Now, in relation to the advisory committee that was mentioned by our learned friend, the, this is a ministerial advisory committee that advises the Minister of Health. The Minister of Health was one of the cabinet ministers consulted on regulations 27 and, 20 and 45, and the NCC endorsed the prohibition on tobacco sales product. Therefore, we, we submit that the attempts to paint the minister as having overturned the NCC decision or the president are not rooted in fact. Then there's something which is raised uh, by the uh, applicants in their replying affidavit <coughs> that the president has admitted that he has no em empirical evidence to support the ban, and that refers to a press release attached as R1 to the replying affidavit, and we submit that that is demonstra demonstrably false. Uh, this is actually a, a Democratic Alliance press release, and states that, and I quote, the Democratic Alliance in a written parliamentary question asked the President on what empirical evidence did the National Coronavirus Command Council rely to collectively ban the sale of tobacco products during the national lockdown to curb the spread of COVID-19. Instead of providing any shred of empirical data as the question requested, the President responded <coughs> that the ban was based on the submissions received and relevant medical literature focusing inter alia on the effects of smoking on public and individual health, especially in the face of a respiratory illness such as COVID-19. The DA press release concludes from this response that the president admitted that he had no empirical evidence to support the ban. It reasons that President Ramaphosa's failure to produce any evidence is a clear indication that there wasn't any empirical evidence to support the ban in the first place. This is the sole basis on which the claim that the President admitted not to have evidence is based. Uh, my Lord, my ladies, we submit that this is just politicking with the remedy. Uh, a fit of six, in effect, an order substituting 
the minister's decision to prohibit the sale of tobacco products to 11, 3 and 4 with a decision not to do so. To succeed in procuring that relief, we submit that FITA must allege and prove that the relief is appropriate in the circumstances. The substitution orders are provided for specifically in, in PAJA. However, since FITA <coughs> review is not PAJA, we consider FITA submissions in this regard must be based on provision in the Constitution, that is section 1721B. This requires FITA to show that a substitution order would be just, would be a just and equitable order in the circumstances. And we submit that FITA has failed to provide any factual or legal basis to support a substitution order as just an equitable remedy that would be warranted uh, in the circumstances. We submit that it's the minister that is the, the functionary empowered by the act to make regulations during a national state of disaster so as to protect the public. <coughs> Where she is found to have acted beyond the ambit of the power, it's not appropriate for the court to usurp the powers conferred on her. We submit <coughs> that the proper course in that case would be for to afford the minister <coughs> an opportunity to correct her action and remedy the extent of the invalidity. And that would uphold the principle of separation of powers and the court would have fully discharged its role as guardian and enforcer of the rule of law. It's unnecessary to grant a substitution order. The court should not be seen to be imposing its preferred regulation of the disaster. And this matter we submit <coughs> Uh, found expression in the, in the secret ballot case. Uh, which held that the minister will not act in line with the legal position and conditional conditionalities. In other words, the assumption that there was, <clears throat> the court should not assume that the minister will not act in line with the legal position and conditionalities as may be clarified by the court. Therefore, we submit that it would not be just and equitable to grant the relief that the applicant seeks. And uh, we will we, we deal with those issues uh, in our main heads. Paragraph 150 to So just to round up the point of, of, of the remedy, <coughs> as, as, as we say in paragraph 151 of the main head, that should the court find that the regulations, uh, 27 and 45, are unlawful or invalid for any reason, the appropriate, just and equitable remedy would be to refer the matter back to the minister for reconsideration, possibly with directions as to the information of, of factors to be considered. Uh, we say <coughs> the evidence is that smokers are more likely to develop severe disease with COVID-19 compared to non-smokers. This in turn increases the strain on the public health system by increasing the number of people who will need access to resources such as ICU beds and ventilators. These are real risks and become even more serious as infection numbers continue to rise. Lord and ladies, 
practically every day, every day, we see the increasing numbers of people affected by COVID-19. We see the escalating numbers of, of, <coughs> of, 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 of deaths uh, as, as, as they continue to rise. So we, we conclude, yes, and, and, and what we also notice, Lord and ladies, is that the daily ratios are also rising. But in conclusion, we say that if the court considers the decision-making process to have been flawed or based on incorrect facts, uh, it will be just and equitable to suspend declaration of invalidity pending a reconsideration. That would serve to ensure that should the ban on further reconsideration be deemed uh, necessary, the public health gains over the last few months would not be undone in the interim. Uh, Lords, ladies, those are our submissions. What are your submissions on costs? Costs. Uh, we are certainly not not asking for costs if we succeed. Uh, although uh, the the matter raised <coughs> strict to sensu. It's not a constitutional challenge, but what we submit that the considerations mentioned in, in BioWatch would be that this is a matter of, of public interest and uh, we, we are certainly not asking for the cost. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Morana. Yes, Court, please. Advocate Subal, any reply? Thank you. What is the do with fruit of this address? The first is the question of the remedy, which was not the end of our presentation. Yes. Which I can just prove it on this basis. Firstly, it's not a review in the sense that there's been a misdirection in relation, for example, to tender, how you score, what weighting. This is an audit declaring, it's declaratory relief, declaring that A, it's not illegal and B, that those regulations which purport to prohibit and render illegal the sale of cigarettes and tobacco are invalid. This isn't a constitutional remedy. It's not a pudger. You also live that under Kojima in the Constitutional Court has held that pudger doesn't in fact apply to the state. So we're dealing four squarely with the legality, but it's a legality in a very narrow sense, of simply declaring that a prohibition is invalid. And that's on the basis a, uh, that it's ultra virus or, or it lacks rationality. If we just test our learner friend's suggestion that it should be referred back for reconsideration, and I'll ask rhetorically, reconsideration of what? We know exactly what the material is upon which the decision was based. We have it. The second respondent has put up what she relied upon. There's no need to go and reconsider that. If in time there's evidence, or whatever the circumstances are that might change, consideration would no doubt be given at the responsible time in a responsible way to a responsible regulation. But there's nothing to refer back to reconsider. The court is in as good a position to determine on these papers that we have all the evidence that's required. And there is only one inevitable outcome. And the inevitable outcome is there is not sufficient to make this regulation prohibiting. So with respect, this is not a case where it's appropriate to simply delay the matter and refer it back for reconsideration and let the matter drift there. This is a matter where the court, with respect, would be justified in simply making the declaratory relief that is sought in our notice of motion. There were then two central themes. 
that were raised by questions from the court to our learned friend. And the one was the link, if any, between the banning of sales and the cessation of smoking. And the question was asked by the leadership of Justice Basson, where is the evidence of that link if we accept that smoking will continue? And the only answer given by a learned friend was, well, it won't, we accept that it won't stop smoking, which is a recognition that there will be criminal conduct because people will, as time goes by, be sourcing illegal products. But he said it's good enough on a reasonable possibility threshold test that maybe certain people will stop smoking and that's good enough. Well, that can't withstand analysis on any basis. Firstly, we know that the test is a very strict one. This is not legislation in the traditional sense. And the Constitutional Court did make it plain that when you interpret the DMA provisions, you've got to adopt a narrow approach for a very good reason. Because you're now acting outside of the normal process of parliamentary oversight, where there's public participation in relation to legislation, and all the checks and balances that are normally in place in relation to legislation are now absent. So of course you've got to take a narrow test. And even I learned from submission that there's evidence that a reasonable amount or some amount or number of people have stopped smoking is with respect simply not borne out by the evidence they rely upon. And might I then, or oh sorry, before I move on, I just want to say something about a learned friend's submission that what the Constitutional Court said was obiter. It wasn't obiter at all. It's, it's rather, but it's an impertinence to label this obiter. Because in fact, what the Constitutional Court said by way of ratio was that when you come to interpret the powers of the municipality in relation to how far can they go in legislating, because they want to, they said it's necessary to give effect to the objects of the DMA by providing in our subordinate legislation for evictions and demolitions. And the court in interpreting the word necessary found that was not necessary. This is really, the DMA is there to put out fires. It's there to deal with a disaster on a pro tem basis. It's interim. It's there to deal with things that are necessary in order, and I've already addressed the court on section 26, read with 27. Now, we, the test for necessary means just that. It must be necessary. Now, we, what our learned friends rely upon when he makes a bold statement as the second respondent does, that they were supported by the WHO in the, in the rationality argument. May I take the court very briefly, without reading documents unnecessarily, but may I just take the court to what the WHO documents actually say to show that this is, there's no merit in the contention that they've established. Firstly, a connection between smoking and an increased risk and uh, therefore burden. And then when I get to the HSBC, I'll demonstrate that that is also a thoroughly unreliable basis to base an argument that there's a link between the banning and the cessation of purchases and smoking. So may I just start, and I just want to give the court some references and highlight it. Firstly, in DZ5, in the answering affidavit, it's in volume 8, I'll just get the page number, 193. Oh, yes. Oh, I seem to have two different uh, page numbers. It may be 008156. Anyway, it's, it's NDZ5 to the answering affidavit. And what, what the court will firstly observe is that this, which was the 8th of May, it came after the, the, the April events, but very importantly, no mention was made of this in the second respondent's initial reasons for decision. I just want to give the court the reference where you'll find it in the record. So the, the summary of submissions originally made 
the court will find in volume 005-1976 as part of the documents that were made available by the second respondent and there was no mention there made of the HSRC and we'll see also how she dealt with WHO in a moment. Now, if I can just give the court references, the HSRC study, a learner friend submits boldly that both that and the UCT study support a conclusion that there was success in the banning because it reduced the number of sales. But with respect, firstly, we would ask the court to have particular regard to what West has said in volume 10 at page 103, following, where he explains that, A, the period of time that the HSRC did the study, one, two, the absence of any supporting data or information that you would need, and the inconclusive nature of it all shows that realistically you can't find that there was a reduction. And it's not a sustainable reduction. The important part is this. The initial reduction in sales was because at that point in time people had stocked up. And also, if people quit temporarily, West, who treats drug addiction and tobacco addiction, explains that this isn't going to be sustained. So there's very little value in taking a snapshot of the very early days of the lockdown and concluding from that that the evidence has shown that the ban is successful in stopping trade. And these numbers and, and statistics are always dangerous unless it's supported. We'd ask the court particularly to have regard to West, not because West gives a different scientific version to the respondents' witnesses. We're not asking the court to resolve the differences in opinion. What we're asking is in regard to the HSRC, that his observations, which are empirical observations, they're common sense observations, be taken into account because he explained very carefully why no credence can be given to that and it doesn't support with respect to the conclusion realistically. And this is from somebody who for many years treats people in this particular field. So you don't have to be a pulmonologist. He is somebody, he's a specialist psychiatrist who treats drug addiction and a very, very convincing argument and observations. And we're talking about objective, empirical observations he makes in relation to why that survey is unreliable. And on the other hand, he refers at page volume 10 at 106 to 107. He explains why the UCT survey is far more reliable. And what has been shown is that there's if people stopped it very temporary, it's recurring. But in any event, it's blown way out of proportion by the minister that it had its effect of reducing. But fundamentally, ultimately, what this court would ask me to submit is, if you say it's reduced it, by how much? How many smokers? How many sales less in this world? None of that is clear. And with respect, when we come to weight against other matters and aspects, it certainly doesn't withstand scrutiny. So at page 105, what, what West says in, in connection with this report, and I'm referring where it says MW71, it's in volume 10 at 105. Um, he says, regardless of the actual percentage used, the UCT report shows clearly that most smokers continued to smoke during lockdown did not successfully quit smoking and purchased tobacco at inflated prices on the black market. This, together with other findings, lead the investigators to conclude that, quote, the current disadvantage of the ban may well outweigh the advantages. And he talks about other things. Now, I should also, while I'm on this document, return to Justice Basson's question to me about what we say about the uh, submission about the 1% of smokers and the increased or enhanced um, strain on the health services. If I can just give the reference where this is dealt with, and we submit with respect, it's, it's, a, it's a common sense uh, observation. At volume 10, page 103. It, it would be helpful to us if you gave us case lines references. Sorry, I can't you? Case lines references. I believe it's 103, volume 10 at 103. Yes. 
Uh, I, I believe that's correct. There must be a number before the 103. 009, sorry, 010, volume 10, and 103. Thank you. Thank you. So it's, it's a West report, and he says in paragraph Roman 2, he says firstly the HSRC report is flawed because a full manuscript is not available, and that's what we asked for under 3512, which we never got, and therefore the methodology, data, and analysis cannot be accurately assessed. Uh, one doesn't need to be an expert to make those observations. This isn't a question of determining which scientist or doctor to believe in. This is something that the court with respect can see for itself. One would imagine that to be compiled manuscript or data set, and what is the response when we ask for it? The response is we don't have any of it to ask the HSRC. It's a rather remarkable approach because it shows that the minister didn't bother to actually call for that data and get her advisors and the experts in the matter to actually assess this. And then he says, to illustrate the burden of COVID-19 and smoking, a scenario is presented wherein 1% of smokers contract COVID-19 and 5% of those require ICU admission. And I hope I'm now going to address Justice Bassoir's question to me because he, he puts us uh, in, in good perspective. And this could overrun the healthcare system, so says the minister. He says, this presumably assumes that all smokers will require ICU admission at the same time, which is unlikely. The 1% and 5% numbers are also problematic, as it is not clear where they are derived from. There are no studies that have shown 1% of any country's smoking population will contract COVID-19. There are also no studies that have shown that 5% of all COVID-19 positive smokers will require ICU admission, even if they are at an increased risk, as the respondent suggests. He then refers to China, which is ahead of the curve of most of the countries, and he says in Roman 3, if the same number were applied to China, for example, which is 300 million smokers, 3 million smokers would contract COVID-19, that's 1%, and 150,000 would require ICU ventilation, that's 5% of 3 million. This is almost 30 times the total number of deaths recorded altogether in China as of the time of writing, which was 4634, is approximately three times the to total number of confirmed COVID-19 cases. The method and reasoning of deriving the 1% and 5% figures is, in my opinion, a guesstimate that does not accurately represent the potential burden of the disease among smokers and does not accurately represent the potential burden of smokers with COVID-19 in the healthcare system. And we submit this, this isn't something that one needs to be an expert on. What he's observing is purely saying, looking at your own document, it makes no sense. So the HSRC, with respect, has absolutely no probative value and certainly cannot be sufficient for a rational, right-thinking person to make an informed decision of the drastic nature that, that we've seen here. So that, that's as far as 1%, 5% is concerned. It really is playing games with numbers and with respect doesn't stack up and it's not supported in any event. So that, that, if that fails, with respect, there's another gaping gap in the respondent's argument. Let's see what the respondent's um, version is about the WHO. And I referred earlier to NDZ5, but may I pick up the later WH that the respondent puts up in their volume 8, it's 008-193. And 008195. And these are the two WH documents. One's 11th of May 2020, and NDZ 9 at 008 195 is at 26th of May. That's the most recent that they respond to a lot of them. Let's look at this. I'm not going to reread 193. I did that earlier today. That's inconclusive. And if I can take the court then to 008195, which is the latest. And let's test our learner friend's argument where he says that Fita is incorrect in saying that at best the evidence has been inconclusive. Well, let's see what the WHO themselves say. I'll show you the court that in every one of these categories, risk of being infected, risk of being hospitalized, risk of death, all in relation to smokers, every one of these, the WHO has pointed out, 
that the evidence isn't there. And indicates that proper studies would need to be done in order to consider that fully. So let me start at 195. At, um, they, they deal with the second paragraph under background. This review therefore assesses the available peer-reviewed literature on the association between smoking and COVID-19, including one, risk of infection, and these are three categories I've just indicated to the court. Risk of infection by SARS-CoV, two, hospitalization of COVID-19, three, severity of COVID-19 outcomes amongst hospitality and so forth. And the, the last category is obviously what the second respondent needs to rely upon to show that there's some rationality. I won't read all of it because the court note can read itself, but 196, let me read what they say about the first category. The risk, what is the risk of smokers being infected by SARS-CoV-2? There are currently no peer-reviewed studies that have evaluated the risk of SARS-CoV-2 infection among smokers. Let's just stop there. No peer-reviewed studies, and West points this out, but it's a, it's a very important issue because one would have expected then at least an amber light to be switched on for the minister. This research re question requires well-designed population-based studies that control for age and relevant underlying risk factors. So that's inconclusive. And when I submit earlier, inconclusive, I do it on the basis of what I read from their own material. I learn a friend to simply argue, without any reference to his own papers, that we are wrong. With respect, there's no merit in that, because their own document which they rely upon, and that first category shows it's inconclusive. Let's look at the second one. What is the risk of smokers being hospitalized for COVID-19? Not, not very different. There are currently no peer-reviewed studies that directly estimate the risk of hospitalization with COVID-19 among smokers. However, 27 observational studies found that smokers constituted 1.4 to 18.5 of hospitalized adults. Two meta-analyses have been published, which pooled the prevalence of smokers in hospitalized patients across the studies based in China. The meta-analysis by Imani et al. analyzed and so forth, there's no conclusion, there's no peer review study, there's, there's just nothing here. Next one, what is the risk of severe COVID-19 disease and death among smokers? And then there's a discussion here, and the court will again see, reading this page in 197, similarly inconclusive. And then, very importantly, at the foot of page 197, is what the WHO says are the limitations in what they say. Hospital-based studies that report patient characteristics can suffer from severe limitations, including poor data quality, collecting smoking history is challenging in emergency contexts, and severity of disease is often not clearly defined and is inconsistent across studies. Such studies are also prone to significant sampling bias. Characteristics of those who are hospitalized will differ by country and context, depending on available resources, access to hospitals, clinical protocols, possibly other factors not considered in the studies. Further, most studies did not make statistical adjustments to account for age and other confounding factors. We know what those are. Those are the comorbidity conditions that we've read about. Well-designed population-based studies are needed to address questions about the risk of infection by SARS-CoV-2 and the risk of hospitalization with COVID-19. We're not imagining when we say that their own material is inconclusive. Conclusions at 198. At this time, uh, sorry, at the time of this review, the available evidence suggests that smoking is associated with increased severity of disease and death in hospitalized COVID-19 patients. We know from, and that's what they seize on, the second one takes a conclusion without reading the rest of the document and what actually precedes us. Although likely related to severity, no evidence to quantify the risk to smokers of hospitalization with COVID-19 or of infection by SARS-CoV-2 was found in a peer-reviewed literature. And this is literature that's been pumped out at an alarming rate around the world since the end of last year. 
And in no peer-reviewed literature is there any support for this. And that's why, with respect, when we say this is not shared by any other country, we're not undermining the sovereignty of South Africa. What we're saying is there is a great deal of work being done on this on an ongoing basis. There's a race to find cures and vaccines and to understand this disease. And that's why they are saying here, there's no peer-reviewed evidence, there's no evidence to quantify the risk to smokers of hospitalisation with COVID-19 or of infection was found in peer-reviewed literature. Population-based studies are needed to address these questions. It doesn't take terribly much analysis on their own version that there's nothing to be said for the prohibition. There's nothing to be said in her reasons. There's nothing to be said in the logic or rationality, or rather absence of it. When you read the own, and this is what she believed, swung her, that outweighs all the other enormously prejudicial consequences that flow from this ban. And then, at 198, what the recommendation is, from the, they don't recommend a ban on smoking, not even the WHO do that. They recommend basically encourage people to stop smoking. Well, nobody will argue with that. But what's telling, WHO recommends that tobacco users stop using tobacco. Nowhere have they said, we recommend that countries legislate now to ban the sale of tobacco and, and cigarettes. And but they, can, they can't do that. Can they? Sorry? Can they? They could recommend it. Mm. Their status is they, they can recommend anything. Mm. But they, and no doubt the reason they don't recommend it mm. is because we see what the negative impact is yeah. of doing that. So when you rationally weigh that up now against what we say, and we don't say it lightly, the notional, highly speculative basis of what prompted this minister to make the decision to expressly ban it, we submit it's non-existent. Yes. Um, the Lord's Ladyship will just give me one moment. So if we, if we conclude that there is no sufficiently reliable evidence of a meaningful reduction of, in smoking and, in there, and link it to a meaningful reduction in the stress or strains that it may place on the healthcare system, with respect, there is nothing left of the argument. Bear with me. I don't know if he wants to put something on record. I have no difficulty there. No. So perhaps he should, and then I'll conclude. Advocate uh, Murana? Was it disclosed in the 3512? Yes. Okay. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's on the record. Before. Yeah, I know. I'm just, I'm just asking how it came in. Did it came via the 3512 request from the applicant? Yes, yes, it was the response. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, of course, that's concerned. Totally the question is, and one can establish very easily where there's a ban. Our understanding is there's no ban in India, and certainly not in Israel. But what you will see is that totally outdated material is relied upon. 
And as the Lord Chief correctly points out, it was in response to the, these guidelines, in response to Rule 35, you'll find it in case lines 011-7. That's India, 15th of April. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Subin. Um, I want to thank the legal teams for the submissions made. We are indebted, and we are indebted that you use case lines which is the digital platform that's used in this division. We are going to retire and consider our decision. And uh, once we are ready, we are cognizant of the fact that this is an urgent application. We will try and expedite the judgment uh, preparation process. And the parties will be advised when judgment is ready. And I think in terms of the current times, I don't think we'll be handing down judgment in open court, even though we had it in open court. The judgment will be emailed to the parties. Thank you. So, thank you very much. Court adjourns.